Let's turn to um, uh, His Excellency Kun uh, Gesit uh, Pirom, uh, senior leader of the Democrat Party, uh, former foreign minister uh, 2008 to 2011. Uh, he's been ambassador to a number of countries, spent 15 years as ambassador to Russia, Indonesia, Germany, um, Japan, the United States. So he's a, a distinguished uh, former diplomat, uh, minister, and, and also a public intellectual. Uh, he's spoken about this before. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of issues now about domestic politics, Thailand, international organizations. Uh, we have had about, uh, we've heard about ASEAN. Bangladesh, by the way, is not part of ASEAN. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, it's a big test for ASEAN, a lot of implications for ASEAN, but what do you do when Bangladesh is not part of ASEAN? So there's a bilateral, apart from regional and international uh, frameworks and, and dynamics. There's also bilateral issues that we'll, we will have to address. Talam Trika Sitkap, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in the summary of the special meeting on irregular migration in the Indian Ocean, 29 May 2015, Bangkok, Thailand. Paragraph 6, let me quote. Representatives of the five most affected countries, namely Bangladesh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, and Thailand, briefed the meeting on the efforts and measures each country was undertaking, etc. I, I think this statement somehow uh, is not quite correct especially in paragraph 6. Myanmar is definitely is not an affected country. How can Myanmar be an affected country? Myanmar is the cause of all the problems. It's the country of, of origin. And I think the whole deliberation on the 25th of May, Myanmar, uh, of, uh, on the 25th of May, I was told that there was no discussion at all on the responsibility of Myanmar as the country of origin of the Rohingyas problem. I think the rest of the attendance, and especially Thailand as the chair, was too timid, too shy to face the fact and say it in straight words to the Burmese delegation that they have to start solving their own problem from the beginning. And uh, let me recall a bit of history. I will not go into the debate of the origins of the Rohingyas inside Myanmar, whether they came before the British Empire, ruling India and Burma at that time, or at the partition between uh, the Indian proper and later Pakistan and Burma proper and the independence of, of Myanmar and so on. But uh, I think there are two points that put the responsibility on the shoulders of successive Burmese uh, Myanmar governments. First is the principle of successor state. And when Myanmar became independent, British rule, or the rights and obligations would have to come together about being independent successor state. The second point is that when uh, successive uh, Myanmar governments uh, negotiated border demarcation with neighboring countries, particularly Bangladesh, India, 
or India, Pakistan at that time, and then India, Bangladesh. There was no discussion, as I could recall, about the Burmese delegation asking the Pakistani or the Indians or later Bangladesh side to take back the Rohingyas to either India proper at that time before the partition of Pakistan or Bangladesh later. So it would have to be assumed that uh, the Myanmar governments at that time accepted the presence of the Rohingyas as their own people inside the territory of, of, of Myanmar. Then the other point is that then General Nevin, I think in the early 1960s, came out with a list of nationalities. And there were 135 and not 136, so the Rohingyas were being excluded. It was a political decision, undemocratic because it was a military government. There was no participatory politics uh, on the side of the people in general and the Rohingyas in particular. But suddenly, by military decree, they were being excluded from being the citizen, rightful citizens of Myanmar. And I do agree with Gwen that because of these uh, upcoming national elections, all the political parties would remain put and would not say a word about the situation with Rohingyas inside Myanmar and a quarter of a million in Kok Bazaar in Bangladesh. And I think altogether maybe a quarter of a million in Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia combined, a bit in Pakistan, a bit in, Bang uh, in uh, India, and of course about more than half a million in, in the Middle East. But it doesn't prevent the international community and the ASEAN nine member countries in particular and the UNHCR, the UN Secretary General and the IOM to keep on reminding and pressuring Myanmar ambassadors around the world and uh, in Geneva and at the United Nations headquarters in New York that there is the responsibility, rightful responsibility of the country of origin, namely Myanmar, to really tackle the Rohingya questions. And I would insist that the Rohingyas, every one of them, has the right to the citizenship of Myanmar. So this is, I would urge the international committee, the diplomatic corps here, my colleagues from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and so on, to keep on pushing the Burmese government to undertake their responsibility and do not export problems to the neighboring countries and to the international community. That's the first point about the responsibility of the Myanmar government, the parliament, political parties, and so on. And I have to say this, that I am deeply disappointed with the behavior, the silence of Do Aung San Suu Kyi. I think with the Nobel Prize, she should have done more than that. And I think she should be the bearer of human rights and democracy, and sometime the bearer of human rights have some time have to forget about being a politician because politician is a insignificant profession but to be the recipient of the Nobel Prize is much more greater and I think this is something for her to to recite to decide I think whether to continue to become a politician or to be the world figure and promoting what everyone around the world, almost 9 billion of us has been expecting her to do, namely to promote democracy and human rights everywhere, not only in Myanmar. That's the first point. Second is that my deep disappointment to the United Nations in general and to the UNHCR in particular, and to a lesser extent to the IOM, that they have not, that, that they have not come out on the forefront to be the coordinator and the motivator of this Rohingya question. I, have, I, I mentioned this because I could not help to recall that when we did have the problems of the Vietnamese both people, 
and then the Cambodian refugees and the Laotian refugees and the Burmese various Thai of Myanmar refugees in Southeast Asia coming particularly to Thailand. UNSDR was more or less on the forefront, very instrumental in coming out with a comprehensive plan of action, which was negotiated successfully and implemented successfully with the three principles. The responsibility of the country of origin, namely Vietnam, the countries of transit, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia at that time, Australia to a certain extent, and the country of resettlement, the international community, you know, to offtake the Vietnamese poor people from the camps in Thailand. And after a couple of years in the early 1990s, we were able to solve the Vietnamese poor people. And I'm a bit surprised that at the meeting on the 29th of May in Bangkok, not a word, and I think in the statement also did not refer back to the question of the Vietnamese poor people and the comprehensive plan of action. And the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand interior and the national security of Thailand were very active at that time. And the UNHCR, I think under the leadership of the Mr. Sergio de Melo, a Brazilian diplomat, highly regarded international bureaucrat from UNHCR, was the most active person. I haven't seen anyone coming out from UNHCR for the past few months or few years being that active. So I would like to urge the UNHCR to be the overall coordinator. You have done a lot of work around the world, particularly on the Vietnamese boat people, Myanmar refugees, Cambodian refugees, on the resettlement and so on. But on the question of the Rohingya, where is UNHCR? And who are the personalities that would have to undertake this very important task? Then, uh, and what the UNHC and IOM could do is not only the question of looking help to helping the host country to look after the Rohingyas in transit, but also on the question of resettlement. But most important of all, I think UNHC and IOM and UNDP, the United Nations in general, can start talking to the Myanmar government about socio-economic development in Rakhine province or state. So the provision of the citizenship by the Myanmar government and parliament must be combined with the international assistance to the Myanmar government and to the Akan or Rakhine state on the social development, economic, education, and all of that, in order to keep the Rohingyas in place and at the same time help the Rakhine Buddhist citizens also, then this international effort will give some sort of incentive to the Myanmar government because they are short of funds and experiences and the international community could come in very strongly in the development at place, at the place of origin. The other point that I would like to take up is that I do, it's the meeting on the 29th of May and the subsequent activity so far is more of a showcase. It's a Hollywood thing. I think we have to be authentic and sincere. We don't do this just to paper over it because you get the international press claiming you and so on. But I think the reality on the ground, it is not what has been said, pronounced, or interviews being given. Because it's not really the few thousands that are at sea at the moment, more or less left to their own death. But I think even in Thailand, there are at least 50,000 Rohingyas. If you go to Ranong province, there are streets 
that are inhabited by the Rohingyas. Or you go down to Hat Yai, or to the tourist spots and so on. So I think it's, it, it, it seems as if the Thai government and the Thai society in general is closing one eye that we now have solved more or less the Rohingyas on the sea. But what about the Rohingyas on land? 20,000 at least or up to 50,000. And they have not been looked after. I give many interviews, I give talks to the Rohingyas at the gathering a few months back. They have asked for some NGOs to look after them, for some agencies in the Thai government. Because unlike the current and other minorities and displaced persons in Thailand, there are organizations that do look after them, except the Rohingyas. And I think this is a bit inhumane. And we are placing all the attention on what is happening at sea. But what about on land? There's exploitation going on. There's enslavement going on. There is torturing going on and so on. And every Rohingya that are outside the enslavement camps have to pay the officials every day. It's a known fact in order to continue the work and not to be arrested or to be deported and so on. And, and who are we? This Buddhist country uh, of Thailand, that's one point. The other point is that we have the Tanjula Lachmontri, the chief Muslim leader of Thailand, appointed by His Majesty the King. We have the central community of the Islamic uh, religious uh, authority here in Thailand. And they have proposed to the government that they are willing to come and help the Rohingyas. They even provided a piece of land in Songkhla province to put all the Rohingyas in a sort of this detention or temporary detention camp and so on. But that has not been uh, responded at all by the government, whether General Payut or various ministers and, and so on. And we need to have the Muslim, Thai Muslim community to come in to help because fellow Muslims, they know how to prepare the food and the places and so on to pray and all of this. The sensitivity, sensitivity to the everyday life practices have to be put in place. You cannot simply just encamp them, put them in a very confined places and so on. And same time, you mix children with the elders, men and women, or, or, or families are being separated. You cannot have these inhuman activities going on all the time at the immigration detention center, which I have visited about 10 of them already all over the country, but nothing has been done so far in a proper manner. So do not forget about the Rohingyas already on land. One last point, I think um, I do agree with, with Kun Kobe uh, that the meetings on the 29th of May by the bureaucrats is not enough. That is the negation of the problems by all the political masters of the 10 ASEAN countries. There must be a political meeting at the ministerial meeting, and I think political decision can be made and the political will can be there. And let's stop this, I think, passing the buck, you know, blaming game and the appearance of being humanistic and so on, but the reality is not everyone doesn't want to really undertake the responsibility. And that's unbecoming of the ASEAN community and the ASEAN Charter. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, this is a tough call on, on, the, on Thailand, on Myanmar government, on, on ASEAN, on international organizations, uh, UN, UNHCR, IOM. Uh, but I have to ask you a quick follow-up. Uh, you've basically confine this, this problem to the Rohingyas. Uh, what about the ones that are coming, the irregular migrants from, say, Bangladesh? I think those that have come from Bangladesh, I, I, I don't forget that we have uh, a quarter of a million Rohingyas in Kok Bazaar, in southern part of Bangladesh. So I, I think that the both people from Bangladesh are the Rohingyas that migrated from 
Myanmar to Bangladesh in the past 20, 30 years. But I stand to be corrected. But I think, I, I believe they are the Rohingyas inside Myanmar and the Rohingya inside Bangladesh, and not the Bengalis of the Bangladesh uh, citizenship. Uh, but that has to be uh, verified. See, but, but the trafficking side of it, if I were the trafficker, I would have preferred to have the Rohingyas from both Myanmar and also from Kok Bazaar in Bangladesh. It's easier because they are related, same stock and so on, easier to control. But if you, yeah, as a trafficker, you start to tamper with the real Bengali, then you are opening up another front and another problem. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And also thank you for, for reminding us of the broader uh, historical context uh, going back to the partition of India. And remember, there used to be a East Pakistan became Bangladesh. So this has deep roots. Uh, now I come to my colleague. I want to first apologize to uh, Jan Kasira for uh, shifting. And I, I, you know, when Gwen pointed to the minister, and I said, oh, yes, and he is next. But in fact, uh, uh, the, in the sequence that we've had on the paper, it should be uh, Jan Kasira. Uh, and she will discuss per perhaps the ASEAN dimension and maybe broader, if, if she likes. Uh, Jan Kasira is a, is a new. Uh, newly minted uh, PhD uh, uh, did her thesis on on ASEAN, and she will be our uh, one of our main ASEAN professors here uh, in the in the longer term. ASEAN, as you know, is a uh, difficult to describe and assess ASEAN. Uh, so this when this problem kind of blew up, you know, it, it was sparked by the discovery of the mass graves, which was unintentional. This problem has gone on for many years, of course, and even decades. But this uh, revelation of the mass graves was unintentional because uh, the people who discovered the mass graves they were looking for something else. Uh, so ASEAN then was put in a in a quandary. What what hap What do you do now? Mass graves in Malaysia, mass graves in southern Thailand, uh, and then the poor people, thousands of them. So initially, typical ASEAN is like you know they say, no problem. It's your problem. It's not my problem. Uh, but eventually, I think the situation turned, the turn of events, uh, the critical turn was when Malaysia and Indonesia, partly plotted by the Philippines, you know, when the Philippines far away came in and said, oh, we'll take some of them, you know, we cannot uh, tolerate this kind of uh, humanitarian crisis. And then Indonesia and Malaysia, through peer pressure, then said, okay, well, we can take them for up to a year, pending resettlement in other countries. And then the U.S. came in a little bit, and maybe we'll resettle some. Um, so he, this is how ASEAN works and doesn't work. Uh, in addition, Bangladesh, as mentioned, is not in ASEAN. Uh, you could make an argument in this case that ASEAN actually has responded positively. Uh, this is a, uh, the, the good side of ASEAN. When enough peer pressure, when enough international spotlight is shown on ASEAN, uh, making it loose face and, and, and so on, uh, that it has come up with something. So Malaysia, Indonesia has paved the way, but nothing since. Uh, I was in the KL last week and in a kind of a group setting. I was asked to uh, brief the group uh, uh, chaired by um, uh, Prime Minister Najib Razak and then privately, uh, he said that you know they could take the migrants, they could take the Rohingya Bengalis and so on, but it cannot be official policy. Right? So in the mix uh, somewhere, we, we have a potential ASEAN modalities, uh, bearing in mind that Bangladesh is not in ASEAN, and this is also a bilateral issue between Bangladesh and Myanmar. Uh, you know, a lot to discuss. So. Uh, Ajahn Kasira, you, anything you want to say, please. Um, Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, regionalization, regulation, regionalism, um, it's all actually intertwined. Regionalism, um, when we talk about that, we focus more on the political process backed by the states. Regionalization, on the other hand, focuses more on the economic flow, the free movement, freer movements of investment, goods, services, labor, merged markets. But both aspects need regulation. And we look at the Southeast Asia in particular. We see that um, while there are still for a community or organization which aims to become a more rule-based organization, we still have very little legally binding mechanism and very little recourse indeed. So um, 
Um, my talk will be about what we got from the, the gatherings in the VKK at the end of May and the slight shift in the norms of ASEAN of how it has perceived um, the problems and how it has changed the ways they've been doing things. It's a little bit from the crisis arisen. Um, but first, some terminology. In the media before um, the crisis has actually emerged to global attention, we'll see um, the, the both people or the, the migration term under the, um, the terminology of internally displaced persons or the IDP, which actually focuses more on well, people who have to flee or leave their homes in order to avoid the effects of armed conflict situations or generalized violence, normally the violence of human rights um, or natural human-made disasters. But um, the problems of the both or the crisis of the both people right now falls under the, um, the, the, the problem of irregular migration more because um, for the IDP or the internally displaced persons, they aim to well, they, they aim to go back to their home country once the situation is safe enough. But for those people, those um, board people, they actually, well, they cross the borders out like, you know, um, regular immigration regulations, so no passport. They, they don't really complete the necessary paperwork, paperwork to leave the home country. So that's actually um, a broader term, it's go beyond, you know, um, the people who want to go back once the situation is safe enough. Because if Myanmar has not actually attempted to address this problem effectively enough, then the, these people may have to find a ways or resettle in, well, in the new country or in the um, receiving countries. Um, illegal migration, though, um, it would be limited to the problems of smuggling of migrants, trafficking in persons, which are all the underlying problems of this irregular migration. So what we have achieved from the gatherings in BKK um, at the end of May, um, basically are three things. We agreed to provide human management assistance. So we basically agree with the um, I am with, with Mr. Labritz that lives come first. So we covered the uh, basic needs. Secondly, we then try to combat the long-term problems of people smuggling, as Thailand has been um, you know, more forceful in cracking down the human trafficking problem and people involved with the process. And thirdly, we then may be the most difficult part of the, the crisis, is that we then attempt to address the root causes of the problem. And these are all worded in the statements, and as you know, it's not very specific to the Rohingyas, um, in particular, um, it's all very good spiritually vague. This is to actually attract Myanmar and to, well, um, to attract the cooperation from them a bit more. Because when the stat statements are not um, termed in a way that is specific to the Rohingyas, Myanmar can interpret this to mean that the situation should be improved for everyone living in Rakhine in that area, in that problematic area of Myanmar. And, well, um, the governments at that meeting perceived that it should be easier for Myanmar to like address their own internal problems. Because Myanmar has long-term political tension over, well, it has their own, uh, it has their own domestic problem to deal with as well. Um, because we've seen sectarian tensions um, simmering over the revocation of the problem of the white cards for people in that problematic area. White cards serve as temporary identification for the people whose nationality has not been verified. And um, while well, many are Muslim Rohingyas holding these white cards who, who have not moved out of the problematic area yet. The underlying problem there is that Myanmar have, has the uh, general election in 2010, right? And then 2012 by election. So white card holders were able to vote in those two elections, but following the protests, recent protests from Buddhist nationalists this year, they were barred from the upcoming election, and the government had given these holders till um, May, or it has been expanded a bit more, to turn in their cards as part of a citizenship verification process. 
so many are reluctant to do that for fear of losing the only document proving the link to Myanmar. So it was a very difficult uh, situation there as well. And the government's um, meeting in the gatherings in the BKK did not want to, well, um, well, our norms in doing things anyway is to not single anyone out, not blaming, not really, you know, exclude nor offend because we want them well we believe that if we don't offend we don't exclude anyone we can achieve more cooperation but and we try to understand that Myanmar has its own well internal problems as well but it might be time to change as um, his excellency mr Gasset has already expressed his disappointments the key point that it has been very difficult for as they to coerce anyone not to like you know to pinpoint the problem and demand from its members is that its normative back backdrop didn't really allow that kind of action um, it has become very difficult when you're familiar with doing things in certain ways for so long to actually you know um, turn turn around and change the ways you you have been trying to cajole people into, you know, if you exchange this, I might do this for you in the future. But Asin has be, has attempted to become more forceful in a way and to be taken very seriously. And if it, it wants to achieve this aim, then it has to take its problem and its members seriously as well. Um, so, well, the current situation now is that Malaysia and Indonesia it has agreed to provide temporary shelter. Um, um, the the Rohingya stranded in the sea have been guaranteed at least security upon rescue and proper screening and that, that was very necessary as well once they reached Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand. So Malaysia and Indonesia have promised already to shelter some 7,000 um, boat people as long as they are resettled or repatriated within one year. The problem is that Indonesia and Malaysia already view this as just temporary and this is a temporary solution they need to be repatriated back but the thing is that as i said this goes beyond the idp problem of internally displaced persons already they cannot go back until the situation improved in their home country so asean leaving its ad hoc way of doing things it has to to aim for a more long-term solution longer term solution, which um, um, uh, many of the panelists have already expressed um, their, you know, their wish that there should be more a higher up level of the meeting and um, the um, more concrete solution arisen from further meetings as well. Um, the problem that I already mentioned is that we have little legal recourse, limited channels for human rights plights, um, because the Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights that we have as of now did really have any redressing channel or any like um, channel for people who are abused to actually appeal to the commission directly. And so we, when we, we face with the crisis like this, we have to rely on political dialogue political mechanism diplomacy. So that's still a very, very important way for ASEAN to, to deal with things. And um, anyway, um, my point here is that we might see a slight change in, in, how, in ASEAN's diplomatic and security culture after all, because Thailand um, had given the United States permission to fly civilian flights over the Thai airspace to identify boats carrying migrants already. And the U.S. missions are already operating from the Malaysian bases. So um, these countries are quite willing to give permission for outside uh, external powers to operate from their bases to enter um, you know, their airspace in, in, for the name of humanitarian assistance. And this is not view at all as you know non um as an interference issue so the strict principle of non-interference the ASEAN has adhered to for so long might be changed a little bit secondly is the involvement of ASEAN in um in 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 the disputes in the region ASEAN has kind of um it separated itself from from any disputes that might concern a number of its member countries. Anyway, 
that norm has been changing a little bit as well. Myanmar, um, as a chairman last year, ASEAN chairman, has chosen the theme of moving forward in unity towards a peaceful and prosperous community. Well, that was a bit of a lost opportunity for Myanmar because it has, re has not really achieved um, anything concrete from its chairmanship. Malaysia becoming chairman this year, 2015. Its theme is our people, our community, our vision, which is also very vague and but very broad. So anything can be um, pushed forward under this theme as well. Um, the thing is that coming with the chairmanship authority is also the authority given by the ASEAN Charter of the mediating power. So the Secretary General and um, the chairman of that year holds the meeting power that they can act on behalf of ASEAN in the name of all member countries to actually um, mediate or offer its help, its services to the need needed countries. And Malaysia should take this opportunity as well because it's also um, very involved um, in the crisis anyway. But still, this mechanism needs the willingness of the, um, the receiving of the affected, the affected countries as well. So ASEAN cannot actually impose or intrude itself because again, that is not what it has been doing things um, so far. Um, all in all, the question, the next question is that what will be the path from this, right? It's a very difficult question to answer anyway because we're still in, um, limbo and we're still waiting for the like, next step, more permanent, longer term solution, which needs the cooperation from all member countries. We can see that the, the most affected countries, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, perhaps the Philippines, but other countries who are a bit um, further away, like Cambodia and Vietnam, can actually play a part as well. So until until ASEAN has come together as a community to work together to achieve a more reliable path, a more permanent path towards permanent residency, the C taboo word, the citizenship, and fully full legal rights, then then the problem cannot be um, you know really addressed at the root causes at the um, the gatherings in the BKK wanted to to. Um, to tackle with. So in the end, I think if ASEAN wants to achieve its aim of being a caring and sharing community at all, like it has like stated in, um, in its documents to become a community in Bali Concord 2003 or in Cebu Declaration 2007, it's not only about the economics, right? It's all into one sociocultural um, factor or the pillar of the community is very important as well. Um, anyway, again, um, the, the way that ASEAN has been doing things um, until now, the norm of you know inclusiveness, because we are so afraid that if we act as a like we we attempt to punish a anyone, then we might exclude that country from ever cooperating with us again. Maybe. ASEAN is a, a stronger, firmer standpoint anyway. Thank you.